Good evening. Welcome to the second session of the Downtown Hot Springs Task Force Game Plan Committee. This task force has been organized and planned by the Greater Hot Springs Chamber of Commerce and the Metro Partnership. The goal of these hearings is to gather information, review current data, and test and validate and revise as appropriate the first of four goals outlined in the 2011 Greater Hot Springs Economic Development Strategy. That goal was specifically identified as downtown development. The task force committee members around here, I'll ask that they just raise their hand quickly as we go around. Corey Alderdice, Courtney Crouch, Keely DeSalvo, Randy Folly, Mark Fleischner, Paul Reiser, Brian Smith, and Les Warren. To provide input to this process, this, we've set up on the city website, that is uh, hscity.org, under the community tab, a blog page to put uh, any input, also comment cards at the back of the room. In the interest of time, there are selected individuals that have been asked to make presentations. We have to keep that restricted to those that were invited to make the presentations, although we welcome anyone to put constructive comments, directions, uh, desires on that uh, blog site. All of those are being read and transcribed and presented to this committee. Uh, we would ask that, you, that the uh, not be any name calling or unsubstantiated accusations there. Keep this constructive. How can we do things better? What can we improve? Uh, as a result, also, in order to keep us in a timeline, there is no public comment tonight. There are nine presenters. Each will be allotted a seven-minute time frame. We're already well over an hour just getting those presenters on and off. Uh, if you have comments, please put them on the blog. Those of you who have already put comments on the blog, understand that, or on the cards last week, please understand that those are being forwarded there to this team to be considered in their recommendations going forward. They may not be answered directly. We did get enough comments last time, though, about the uh, Thermal Basin Fire District perimeters that there, there is a copy of that map now on the, uh, on the website. So go to hscity.org, and under the Our Community tab, you can find a nice PDF file of that that you can drill down into and see exactly the, the boundaries of the uh, Thermal Basin Fire District. Tonight's topic is the downtown property and business owners. We're asking for their experiences, future plans for their buildings, and obstacles they face. Admittedly, this is just a sampling of the owners and, and uh, uh, business managers. Uh, we've only had time for nine presenters. Uh, they will appear in order by a random drawing that we had uh, in, to, for the sequence. Uh, They'll be given a maximum of seven minutes. Even at that, seven times nine, and we're well over an hour. Uh, but then the com committee may ask them follow-up questions once the presenter has, has finished with their seven minutes. We ask that when those questions come out from the committee here, that the presenters answer the question as, as quickly and cleanly as they can so we can move on. Stay on topic, please. As each presenter approaches, We'd ask them to introduce themselves and the businesses they represent, the location of that business and how long they've been in business, the goals for their business, their visions for downtown, obstacles they've encountered, and advice they would have for others and future needs. Okay. With that, I would like to ask uh, the first presenter to come and start their presentation uh, Elizabeth Ferris. Oh, making up time, are we? Elizabeth isn't here. Ken Wheatley. Yeah, I'm Ken Wheatley. Um, what were the questions? We've got a few buildings downtown. Yeah. Um, and I'm uh, pleased to be able to 
to announce tonight that uh, I've entered into an agreement with Steve Wynn in Las Vegas to put in a casino downtown in four of my buildings. <laughs> and I thought that would really help with economic development. So <laughs> nobody takes me seriously. <laughs> no. You know, I, I'll tell you a couple of quick things, and I'll try to keep it. Keep the, where's the clock? Sorry, we can't have it on the screen. Oh, okay. All right. You just shout then. All right. Give me about eight minutes. Uh, this is kind of an unprecedented ambush, I think, and, and not that the concept is bad, but the ambush uh, on the people that actually are doing business downtown. Um, I'm not so opposed to development. Uh, what I'm surprised at is that, you know, uh, I'm delighted that the chamber has listened to the third guy <laughs> that they've consulted with in the last 20 years who said how important the downtown is. I'm glad that the city is involved with it and they're excited about it. But uh, I found out a couple of very interesting things as I've done some research on this. One, I found out in the state of Arkansas that the coroner can arrest the sheriff, and I didn't know that. And then I also found out that the fire chief has incredible power. I mean, it's, it's uh, maybe a throwback to the old days, but he's got a lot of power. So I've been told by at least four or five architects, don't make Ed mad. So I'll be really careful what I say tonight in trying to, trying to temper... Uh, what we f I feel like has is, is, is kind of happened to us. Um, it's not so much that we don't want development downtown. Uh, it's that we'd like to have it collectively. Uh, the chamber's finally gotten involved and said, hey, we're interested. We want to do something. Uh, the city obviously is, is trying to get involved and wants to do something. The problem is, is that for, what is it, 18, 19 months? Uh, and I know that there's at least three of you up there that was on the raiding party that ambushed us. Uh, talk secretly and talk quietly and didn't even include the people that are going to be involved in it. There are a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas. Uh, the Performing Arts um, Center that, that was announced or that was shown last night, great idea. Uh, love to have it down there. It makes a big difference on how you're going to do something downtown and maybe what you would, you would spend your money on and how, what direction you would take in the buildings that you have. And so it seems to me that the, the question that came to this morning early was, there's, why would you exclude the people that you're targeting their buildings in that process? Why would they be excluded from the conversation? And it dawned on me that it's probably because the group that's, that's organizing this probably doesn't have, have the same goals as the people that own the buildings. And so to sit around a table and say, here's, here's our dream, is in conflict with their dream, it maybe wouldn't be, wouldn't be very productive. Um, that means to me uh, that maybe uh, more ducks and more T-shirts and more little shops like that are not the direction. And I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I wish we had a city like Charlotte or uh, a borough of Chicago or Boston or New York or something where we had hundreds and thousands of, of workers uh, who lived and worked and ate and cleaned and, and shopped and did everything they did down there. But to think that we're going to get that initially is kind of hard. And so what, what, what I'm frustrated with only is the idea uh, that we were ambushed to say, you're going to go spend your money. You don't know what it's on. You don't know what direction you're going or we're going. Uh, and yet, uh, you go spend your money. And then once you get something done, we'll see if it is compatible with our plan. I'm just not sure why we don't have all the players sitting down at the same table and talking the same thing. I don't expect all of you to agree with everything any of us do uh, and vice versa. But you would think collectively we could do something together. And that's what, the, that's what the big problem is. What do we want to do? You know, we've got 47 tenants down there. I see some of them sitting back here. They're going to tell you about the economy in Hot Springs. That may not be the economy that we want to get to. And that may not be where what buildings you want to occupy and what you want in those buildings. But at least collectively, we need to do something together with that. And that's, I think, the fr that's the frustration and the anger that you're sensing from back here. It's kind of an interesting deal. We do have a new code, 2012. I haven't heard a, a, great, a, a great rumbling throughout the state of everybody that got attacked by the 2012 code and all the other, other towns that are having trouble with it. Uh, I, don't hear a lot of I don't hear a lot of fire basins being put in the state. So something happened there. So it's a good tool to use and a nice thing to have. Um, you know, I, I don't know what happened to the vacant building code. Our buildings are clean, completely cleaned out. Uh, the roofs are, are solid. You know, the first time I, I met with my friend Ed, uh, that uh, he, you know, he told me he didn't want another Majestic. Well, I don't either. But it wasn't a sprinkler system, and it wasn't anything else. It was the, it was the roof that fell in. 
That's what the problem was. So the rest of the buildings are there. I don't understand why you know, we think it's necessary that we go fix a building that there is no occupation for yet. You know, if, they build, if you fix it, they will come. You know, Anthony's a friend of mine. He's probably here somewhere. Uh, you know, he, he's got a great, great story there. He's kind of the poster child for put a sprinkler in, somebody will come. But that's not really what happened. He had a business that wanted to expand. He put a sprinkler in because they wanted to expand to it. He didn't put a sprinkler in, put a sign out and said, I have sprinklers now. Would you like to come to my building? And that's the only objection I've got. I'd like to sit down with some people and do some planning. That means I'd like to slow it down a little bit so we can at least sit together and talk about what plans there are. You know, I've got eight or ten ideas that would be wonderful for downtown Hot Springs. It may not be compatible, and that may be the rub. That may be the conflict with the group that's pushing this and, and the rest of the ones downtown may not be the direction they want to go. And so if we talk, it may be, uh-oh, that's in conflict. You know, that's not what we're looking for. I don't want tourists. I want redevelopment. And that I think that this morning I kind of came up with that idea and said, you know, it's not Tourism 101 for this group. It is redevelopment and to have themselves a, a great downtown. So anyway, uh, I have to be careful. If Ed and I were friends, if we fished together, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight. Okay, not that we wouldn't be, wouldn't be doing development, but Ed would have come to me and said, hey, there's a group that wants to develop downtown Hot Springs. The chamber's all excited. We're excited. We need to get everybody together. Whoops. We need to get everybody together and talk about how we can do that. How can we accomplish that? The time is right. Let's do it. And that's what my friend Ed would have done. We don't fish. I don't either. Okay, that's really all I've got to say. Yes. I'll let you send that in. Mr. Okay. Wheatley, Mr. Wheatley, I have a question yeah. for you. Hey, that was pretty good. If you had the, oppor if you had the opportunity to, to sit down at the table, who would you want to be present at this meeting? Well, I, I wouldn't call them the Gang of 20, but I understand there are 20. And I, I, don't, I don't know who the, who the players are, and I really don't even care. I, I, I probably walk by them all the time. Um, I'm interested in people that want downtown Hot Springs to develop. And the problem, the problem we've got is we see Hot Springs as it is. Now, if you took pictures downtown 15 years ago, it's remarkably better today. Not where it needs to be, but remarkably better today. It's, it's cleaned up. It's awninged up. It's, it's got different kinds of stores and things. The economy dictates a little bit of that. But I think the, the Gang of 20, as we'll call them, uh, has, a, has a vision for the community. Well, that's great. Share it with us. Don't do it in the back corners. Don't try to take the buildings away from somebody. You got some people out here that aren't going to get to speak today. It's all they have. You know, and we're not talking about ten dollars or $20,000 for somebody. We're talking about a half a million dollars, $250,000. Big numbers, especially if you don't know where you're going. So it's kind of fueled, I think, to ask them to do that. So, yeah, the, the people I'd like to see, well, uh, you know, I... I don't know Fran very well, but his history is uh, downtown developments. So I've seen some things that he's done, cities he's been in, and, and stuff that's accomplished. That's great. Um, I would expect the chamber to be able to come and say, hey, we're searching. Uh, we're, we're, we're putting the notice out that we want our downtown development. Here's the structures that we've got, and here's what we can do, and here's the opportunities they have in our city. There are a lot of cities that do what y'all are asking to do that don't succeed. I think we've got one of the best opportunities ever because of the location, because of the, the scenic beauty of it, the national park. All of that's real positive. I think it can work. But we need to work collectively. Why would you want me to go out and do a building and put in shooting arcades on three floors if that's not the direction the rest of the community wants to go? And I think that's, that's what's missing to me in this is that the people that own the properties were completely excluded. Well, and in order to keep things on track here, yep. please, if you would, I ask that you address the question the question is who would you have well on the, that this the, I, would, the I would have somebody have the somebody from the chambers and the gang of 20 whoever they are we'll get them out here can, can we get that list of names and submit it oh they'd have to tell me it's the group that's been meeting some of the 50 for the future it, it's it's community i mean these these people have a, a, the community and interest in mind i think yeah. i know they do uh, but what they need is get out on the table so we all talk about it because somebody has the assets and somebody has the ideas. I think the people that have the assets have some ideas as well. 
So we, we'd like to we'd like to do that but to the extent that you can provide the task team with names. That would be well. I mean, they'd have they'd have to provide would. their names. <laughs> They're the ones that are hidden, not us. Okay. So, yeah. So anyway, that 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 would be all. You know, uh, they they know who they are and they know what they're doing. Good thoughts. They know who they are. They have access to the blog, and we'd ask that they provide that input. Well, sure. Some of them are sitting blog. right here. Okay. Yeah. No question. If they can provide it that way, then perhaps we'll if, be able to address if, that. If that's something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, Kim. An another question, um, Mr. Wheatley. When you said it, you asked that the process be slowed down. Can you elaborate on that? What What are you wanting to be slowed down? Or the you know, that that's a that's a moving target, I guess. If you if you ask some of the people, they're talking. They'd like to have three years. Is it reasonable to tell somebody you either fix this and spend the two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars that you don't have, or you sell your building? That's kind of a fire sale. Uh, we've been asked to go out, and there's 24 targeted buildings. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. 24 buildings that we've selected. Uh, you, you're asked to go out and find some architects, and, we, and we've got great architects in town, and they probably can get it done. Then you've got to go out and fire, hire uh, sprinkler people, and you've so got are, to get that done. Are you, ref are you referring to the corrective action plan that has to be submitted? By a certain date, is that uh, what you're yeah, saying? That, when you yeah, say that, slow that whole down? process. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. That may be reasonable. It doesn't seem reasonable to me. If 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 you're going to ask me to sell a building because I can't afford to fix it, then you're making me have a fire sale. You know, you're telling me I've got to go sell it. I'm under duress and stress, and somebody's going to get it at a bargain because I can't afford to do that. Under threat, I'm going to get a fine and go to jail. So that's a that's a little bit harsh for a community, I think. Um, I would think so. Now, stretch it out for five, ten years? Of course not, you know. But what helps that process is people coming together and talking about a cohesive plan. Here's the vision for downtown. And the only thing that can keep that from happening is if the cohesive plan for this group and this plan, this group are not the same and they're not going to get together, then I can understand why this group says I'm not going to tell them a thing and I'm going to sneak up and attack them because they're not going to believe this group will buy into that plan. That's all I can think. Thank you. Ken, you, yes, ma you said you had eight or ten ideas for, for downtown, your own ideas. Sure. Could, could you share with those, uh, some, of us, uh, some of those with us, please? Well, um, I've listed them somewhere, and I don't, I don't have them with me right now. Uh, one of the, my wife said, don't you dare tell them this, but I've got to. Uh, one of our greatest assets is our thermal water. You know, I know all of you that have been here for a long time know that we tried it a few years ago and it didn't work. It's, it's our unique selling proposition. How many people have a performing arts theater? Every major city. How many people have a baseball field? Every major city. How many people have thermal water? One. I don't know what that looks like. I know we have some baths, but it is, if, if you guys, Chamber, would get out and go down and talk and don't anybody listen back there. Go down and ask every merchant downtown and every hotel person what the number one question is for tourists when they come to town. It is, where can I go experience the water? And they're talking about outdoor bathing, I promise you. They're talking about sitting in a pool somewhere. It's a winter activity. It adds to it. Now, that's not the, the catch-all, end-all, but it catches it. Uh, we, we've, crazy, well, we've got to think outside the, outside the, the lanes. If you're getting a bypass, which the chamber's pushing for, I'm going to get that, then we're going to slow down traffic downtown Hot Springs. Why don't we bring this highway back to two, two lanes, all right? Slow it all down. Put in some pedestrian walking ways. Spread it out. Let them people have strolled and relaxed down here. Same thing with Whippoorwill back there. Maybe it's not a street. Maybe it's a pedestrian way that a tri fire truck could go up to if they wanted to. Uh, we talked at one, time at, at one time about having a, a chairlift or something up to the tower. Just something for people to do when they get here. Entertainment's important. Uh, the performing Arts Theater is great. I don't know how often you're going to use it, but if you're talking about putting it where the Majestic is, that's a really critical place, really valuable piece of property for us to put something. And I personally, if you had me on the committee, I'd say, golly, you're not going to use it, but X number of times a year, why would you take up the most important place in town, most visible spot downtown, and do that? Um, suggested putting a pavilion over uh, Hill Wheatley Park. Uh, something you could have concerts all the time. You could do something, uh, outdoor events. Uh, you know, that you, you go to some of these major cities, they've got some great pavilions that you go to, and that's where people go. Um, oh, gosh. 
I think I think we've tried trolleys. That didn't work for us so well. But if you if you slowed the traffic down like it's going to, and we could use some of the little uh, the pull along carts, uh, the like you see at Disney World and that kind of stuff, the smaller things to transport people on and off up and down the streets instead of the big trolleys that were so expensive and stuff, gives us something to do. Now you have to understand those kind of things I'm talking about are tourist related and tourism related. Uh, I know there's another market out there somewhere, but most of that market is either not here all the time, they love to come to a condo, and that's wonderful news, except that market also travels a lot. The timeshare thing is not come and gone, it's, it's come, but there's, that's not as big a market as it used to be. And so we don't have a thousand couples or a thousand singles that have high paying jobs, tech jobs or really, really good jobs in our market that want to live, eat, and sleep. I would love to see it, live, eat, and sleep downtown, have a, have a, a grocery store, have a cleaner, have all that kind of stuff. That'd be really cool. But you drop that in a town that's got 40,000 people living downtown, not 200. And so I, I can't get away from the tourist idea. I do know that a few years ago when, when Arison had a, had a poll made, the number one reason people came to Hot Springs for the very first time was downtown Hot Springs. That's the reason they came. And I'm glad the Chambers heard that. I'm glad the city's behind that. We just need to be collectively help each other to do that. I think if we switch totally one way or the other, we're making a mistake. Thank you. Did I get your answer, Mr. Summer? Yeah, long answer, sorry. All right. You and as, as you it. said, you had quite a number, and I, I picked a few out of there. As you remember some of those other ones, please get them on the blog, and let's, let's work with, with all I the will. ideas we have, please. I'll make an educated guess. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Wheatley. Am I going to re get a reprieve on my mistake? Mm -hmm. Okay. I opened the meeting and brought our first speaker up, and prior to that, uh, Mayor Ruth Carney wanted to say something to the group. So if you come forward now, I apologize for skipping. I want to thank you for allowing me. I'm not a property owner, but I have um, a lot of interest in our city. And I would like to just read this um, to you. My name is Ruth Carney, and I'm the mayor of Hot Springs. As many people know, our city has been fractured and dysfunctional for years. Dysfunction in families usually is not the result of problem-free living, but it's a result of lack of communication and failure to discuss the issues with the members of the family to reach a desirable outcome or solution to the problems they face. Three and a half years ago when I took office, it was evident that the property owners, not just the merchants, of downtown buildings were blatantly excluded from all discussions concerning downtown redevelopment. I, by virtue of office, am a member of the Metro Partnership, formerly the Garland County Economic Development Corporation, and I also discovered just recently that I've been a voting member of the Chamber Board for three and a half years, but I've never been invited until the last meeting. I was placed on a committee to reach the and address the issues of downtown development. I immediately asked if the property owners had been invited to the discussion and was told they don't cooperate. When our new city manager arrived, I discussed the issue with him and asked that the property owners be included in the discussions concerning their buildings. When Mr. Fram arrived, he immediately started talking with city officials, and during my meetings with him, I emphasized the need for the property owners to be involved with the discussion of downtown redevelopment. When Chief Davis made an appointment with me to inform me of the new Thermal Basin Fire District and the downtown buildings, I asked him if he had talked with any of the property owners, and he had not. I highly recommended that he contact Mr. Wheatley, who owns many of the buildings, before he went forward with the plan. The first time the ordinance came to the agenda, in the pre-agenda meeting with City Attorney Brian Albright, I suggested that we delay the issue and have a work session so we could fully understand what the ordinance entailed. The agenda item was pulled, but no work session followed. The next agenda meeting, the issue was presented again, and we asked if all the information would be in the packet, and we were informed that it was too large to fit into the packet. We were given a brief explanation of the new fire code, and in essence, we were convinced that this was a lesser, and the word lesser was used over and over, a much easier approach with less requirements than the standard Arkansas fire code. During the next board meeting, I continued to feel that we were not clear on the total ramifications of the ordinance, and asked ask twice, actually three times, because I've watched that meeting over and over on Hot Springs CityHS.net, which everyone can watch if you're wondering what happened in that meeting, and asked twice during the meeting to table the issue so that there could be a public work session for the board, 
who definitely did not understand what they were doing, and the property owners who did not understand. I felt pressured and was encouraged to believe that we had no choice but to vote on the lesser of the two codes because it was a state code and the other code would go into effect on January 1, and for some reason it would cause much more work and money to comply with that code. Hesitantly, I voted yes for the chief... Uh, yes, after the chief said that the letters of noncompliance would go out on January 1, and after that, he would, quote, close them down. That was on the, the YouTube video. The meeting can be watched on the city webpage since the time I have seen letter after letter after letter to these property owners that they have received listing multiple violations, not including the mandated sprinklers and means of aggress. Uh, these letters stated that these issues must be dealt with immediately. These mandates plus the, plus the sprinkler system and egress will cost the property owners multiple of thousands of dollars. Still no public meeting other than the board meeting where the fire code was passed. Finally, the Metro Partnership and Chamber Executives sat down a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday evening with the downtown property owners and listened. That was the first time ever, and something that has never happened with city officials and property owners as a group. Communication permits progress. If this had happened three and a half years ago when I first took office, when I first requested to be involved, maybe there would have been no need to establish a new fire code that applies to only 24 buildings. And maybe we would not have passed a pressured to pass a classic example of we have to pass it to find out what's in it. I voted yes, but after seeing the confusion and inequities it has caused, I must apologize for my vote and for not representing the property rights of the citizens of our community. These property owners have invested their money and their lives into our community for years. They have dreams and visions, but no one was sitting down to listen until now. I noticed on your list of people to talk, um, Penny Gargano has talked with me many times. They have invested in many buildings downtown, and that's their private family business, and they have no money to do other things with. She even mentioned to me that they would not have bought the Regency if they had known they had to do the sprinkler system. Um, there are many others. Long while I've looked at the pictures of his remodeled building that he has done per code and complied with everything the code department told him to do. And he is being uh, required now to sprinkle the other, other part of the building that he has not the money to do. But I want to thank Mr. Fram and Brian Smith for your efforts to create a functioning city. Thank you. Are there questions for the mayor? Next would be Lisa Carey with All Arkansas Stone. Thank you. My name is Lisa Coleman Carey. I am the owner of All Things Arkansas at 610 C Central Avenue, and I'm honored to be here today as one of the newer businesses in downtown Hot Springs. I don't always feel like I'm part of the newer businesses, though, because my father is Ron Coleman, who owns Ron Coleman Mining. One of his many operations is here in Hot Springs. As a result, I got to watch the last revitalization of Hot Springs. One of Dad's clients was Benini, who many of you know and have heard of. And I remember in the late 80s going to visit his property, and he told me, oh, you should have seen it beforehand. It was knee-deep in pigeon shit. As a teenager, you don't forget that. And it stayed with me. And about a year ago, Rex Nelson put an article in the Democrat Gazette. I'm not talking about the article everybody read last month. We all have read it. He had one a year ago, and it was forwarded through 50 for the future. And I read it. And I read it again. I sent it out to Dorothy Morris. I sent it to my father. And I began thinking. And I thought about what happened in El Dorado with Murphy Oil Corporation, where they bought up every building that surrounded their headquarters because they wanted to ensure the integrity of the area in which they were. And at that point, the dream blossomed. I wanted all of the downtown area. That includes Whittington, Park Avenue, where I am now, Ramble, and on and on, to return to the glory that I remember and that I know it can have. What great living spaces we have down here. What a great area in which we can run, we can walk, we can cycle. 
What a great place for us to shop and to eat. That's what I wanted to do. So I began the process. Longwa Shu rented his space to me. The ceiling of my section of the building had to be altered to meet new fire code regulations as he was adding on a gallery and living quarters up above. The rest of the space was in excellent condition and all I had to do was paint the facility and we buffed the floors. And on July 23rd of last year, we opened All Things Arkansas, featuring products from the state, made in the state, and relating to the state. Right now, we are also developing plans for a second store downtown. You can keep an eye out for that, and you should hear more within the next year. Right now, I also am only a renter. I'm happy to do that. I would prefer to be a property owner, but I continue to wait for the right time and for the right property. And to be honest, I'm waiting for everybody to figure out what's going on downtown. To open the store, I worked closely with the Arkansas Small Business Development and Technology Center through Henderson State University and often meeting at the chamber. In addition, I worked closely with Arvest and attorney Carl Crow. To be honest, my only real struggle in opening the business downtown was in working through the regulations through the city of Hot Springs. Let me be very clear, the city answered any and every question that I asked. The problem was, sometimes I didn't know what questions to ask. And so right when I thought I had done everything that I was supposed to do and I was ready to open the doors, I asked that final question. So there's nothing else, right? I'm good to go. There was more. And it ends up that I had not gotten permits either for the signage on my storefront or for the sandwich board outside. Two things to note about this. One, when I went to the meeting for my sandwich board, nobody actually knew who should be approving it. If they didn't know, I definitely didn't know. And secondly, I have heard that there is a list of everything that needs to be done. I'm sure that's probably true. But if that's the case, we need to immediately let people know exactly what needs to be done. We need to have that checklist to work from. I know a lot of people in the city, and I'm not afraid to look like an idiot from time to time. I do understand, though, that many small business owners, as they're trying to get into this process, they don't know what they're doing, and it might stop them from moving forward. So we need to get that fixed. Again, everybody had answered anything I ever asked. All, thing, all Things Arkansas has been doing quite well since we opened our doors last July. I would not consider expanding to a second business if that were not the case. But what I would like to see is more businesses with their doors open in the downtown area. When visitors pass by closed doors, and there are several just north of me, they may stop their process. If they stop, they will never have a chance to visit the other wonderful businesses in our area. The more options people have for food, for hotels, for entertainment, and for shopping in the downtown area, the better off every one of us is. If you travel downtown to visit Tillman's, to visit Larray's, or to visit the Blue Moon Gallery, that is great because there's a good chance that while you're there, you may see another storefront and want to stop there as well. We need to have those businesses open in order to have a vibrant downtown. In addition to having more businesses open, we need to have more and more events in the downtown area. The more events that occur, the better off my business is and the better off our entire town is. We need a location for weekend events. I have heard many suggestions for how to add a site for entertainment purposes and Ken Wheatley just named a couple of them. I have my own ideas but implementing any of them has the potential to impact the small businesses, the city, the county, and our entire state. I was born and raised 15 miles from here in Jesseville, Arkansas. I went to college out of state, and I've worked for a Fortune 500 company before returning to this area and spending 13 years at National Park Community College. I returned to central Arkansas and have now established myself in downtown Hot Springs because I love and because I believe in our community. We live in one of the most beautiful areas in the world, and just as Coleman Quartz sets the world standard for quartz, I believe Hot Springs can set the world standard for places to visit. To do that, we must work together. 
We must fill the buildings. We must promote our downtown hot springs. And we must cross-promote one another. We must fill our in- and out-of-house publications with the wonders of all things hot springs. Together, we can and will set that standard. Thank you. Questions? I do, Ms. Curry. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to tell you, you do have a beautiful, a beautiful looking facility. You really do, especially at night, the way it, it lights up. Thank you. Uh, you. You talked about ideas that you have for the downtown that would affect downtown residents, downtown businesses, the city itself. Would you share some of those ideas with us? Well, in a nutshell, what I want to do is see those other buildings filled. We have a huge Bank of America property. It needs to have something happen in it. Right north of that, you've got about, what is that, 3,000 square feet? I think that's where Benini used to be, as a matter of fact. Also unfilled. Those second floors could have other businesses or, and I've heard this many times, apartments being added in. I know I have people sitting near me that I'm related to that also have talked about wanting to live downtown. We need to fill those up. And we need to, let's be honest, some of the areas in the downtown area, and I'm just going to speak north, kind of moving on into Park, Whittington areas, we need to revitalize some of those and revamp and make sure that people are safe where they live as well. In addition to that, I would really like to see something. I think a pavilion is a great idea. I think a performing arts center is a great idea. Something to move venues weekly downtown so that people have a place to come and visit both locally and those who are from elsewhere as well. Thank you. Ms. Kerry, when you're, when you're speaking of events, Mm -hmm. What type of events would you like to see downtown? I'd love to see music events. They've had skateboarding events in the past. I mean, you can do almost anything. We've got motorcycle rallies. There are, I'm not the expert in what kind of events. If it brings people and they have money with them, I'd like to see it come on down. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Ms. Carrie, do you... Do you, or, yep, do you find the, um, you talked about the city regulations. Uh -huh. Do you find those regulations for establishing a business onerous or do you just find them kind of invisible? They were mostly invisible. They were not that difficult. It was just stepping through the process. And I, the list that I was working from, I believe, was primarily a list out of Little Rock. It was a great list to work with, but I needed something a little more local. Could you, I mean, do you, are, are you talking about hand holding the uh, potential owner? And I don't mean that in a, in a, no, as a matter way. of fact, as a matter of fact, in my speech, which I think I missed because I quit looking at my notes, I said I don't expect anybody to hold my hand. Um, and that is correct. A little bit of what I said sounds like holding my hand. That's not what I expect. But gosh, just a checklist to go through. And I think such a thing may exist. I have heard since then that it does. I just never got it. Okay. Well, I started a little business, and I could have used some hand-holding. I'm <laughs> That's all for I'm that. Asking. I, I have no problems with that. I take every bit of help that I can get. But at the same time, I understand that I'm the one establishing a business. So. Understand. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Lisa, I appreciate what you've done. How many times in your process did you think that you had completed all of the requirements and approached the city to open <clears> your <throat> business only to find out? you had more requirements. There was only one time that I had really thought that I had finished, and at that point I found out there were two steps that I had not taken. Okay. Any other questions? Carrie, okay, thank you very yes. much. You. Next on the agenda then is Rick Williams, property owner. And if you'd introduce yourself and your businesses, your vision for downtown, a little bit of that. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Rick Williams. I own, uh, I believe, eight, nine, ten buildings downtown Hot Springs. Uh, recently uh, acquired a few of those. Uh, what What are the questions that uh, that I'm presenting here? What as far as are you asking what's my thought on the city or what am I planning to do with my building? Is that what we're doing here? What are your experiences, future plans for your buildings? What obstacles have you faced? 
And really, okay. really what I we're about here is I apologize. I've been how- open in a hospital in Jonesboro, so I'm just now catching up to this meeting. So, okay. uh, What can it, the Chamber and the Metro it, Partnership do to help you? Okay. Uh, first off, I've been, I've been very pleased with the city of Hot Springs. Uh, I think short, second to the embassy suites, I've spent about $28 million here. So that's a fairly large project at the atrium. Uh, the old Lake Hamilton Resort. I can tell you that currently I've got 201 Market Street, which is the existing landmark building y'all are familiar with. I have it and surrounding about six projects planned probably in the next six months. Uh, You'll be really pleased to see that. I think that'll change the area. I'm probably going to spend in the neighborhood of two to three million dollars in that particular little circle there. Um, And like I say, I've been real pleased with Hot Springs. As far as I sit in the the meeting with the chamber a while back and gave them my two cents on how I think the vacant buildings should be handled. Naturally, I have a few because I've recently purchased them. Um, Again, when you're dealing with life safety code, I'm real sympathetic to the property owners, but we're also dealing with life safety code. So I think, again, I own a 200,000 square foot hospital that I'm currently opening in the next 60 days with patients, which is an old Methodist hospital in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So as I would tell the city and as I told the uh, chamber, my recommendation would be to hire several architects on a committee to find out how you get, how you still protect life as well as don't bankrupt your property owners that own these buildings. Um, I think you do that. I think uh, Chief Davis's main concern is that the fires would continue to run uh, contiguous with the buildings as because the, they're connected. I think you could create firewalls on some of the vacant structures. Uh, some of Ken's buildings uh, are fireproof buildings. The Thompson building's a masonry structure. That's probably not. I mean, there's. I think you look at each building and each section of the town differently, uh, and what the building's made out of um, to address the fire code. But again. Uh, my buildings, I never have a problem with the city because I have a history of overspending on everything that I buy. Uh, I'm going to put sprinkler systems in, whether it's required or not. Uh, it's just something I'm going to do. I think you've got to find the right buyers and the right developers. I can tell you, a friend of mine, Brian Gerke, and he's done a lot for Hot Springs. Um, he's part of the reason I've spent my $28 million here. Um, He called me one day on the Lake Hamilton Resort and said, hey, this property is going to be sold at a really cheap price. And I can remember I was competing against a guy that was going to put a $60 sleep cheap in that hotel. It just wouldn't have been good long term for that piece of property. And since I've spent 20 plus million dollars, you see Chicken Express, you see uh, so much development out that way. You see Harps has bought out there and developed. And that was kind of a depressed end of town. So it's amazing when you do something good and you spend that extra money that people seem to follow. I I would say the same thing with downtown. I ran a pro forma a while back. Um, I don't even know the name of the building. It's seven story. It's the old bank building, the white building. Randy, I seen you the other night in front of it next to uh, Spencer's Corner. And that entire block, if I bought from that building all the way past the Malco to the Regions building around the Landmark building, I figured it was going to cost me about $16 million to buy all the buildings and pay a fair price for them as well as redo them. Then I looked at the market rate rents for that $16 million, and I figured, well, I could probably only get about 100000 a month. So no one's going to make, no good businessman's going to make a $16 million investment for a $100,000 a month return. So I think we've got to be careful what we are looking for and what we are going to put in these spaces because you don't want someone to overdevelop and them not survive and it go bankrupt or not do well. Um, I can't tell you that 
again, in the next six months, I have probably seven or eight projects downtown that I'm actually developing, have good tenants for, and really going to spend a lot of money on them. Uh, and you guys will see them as you come into the to the city, uh, naturally on the uh, 201 Market Street Square there. But again, the old bus station, I think 1001 Central, I was fixing to put a tenant, one of my parent companies that I own. I own a little medical equipment company. And I was fixing to spend a couple of hundred thousand there on that corner, and I look across the street, and my neighbors painted their building purple. I don't have anything against purple buildings, by the way. You can do whatever you want. But I kind of told, I told Brian, I said, you know, I'm probably not going to spend another quarter of a million dollars on this corner looking at a purple building. So I think we have to get together and find out, have a real strict uh, scenic easement. You know, what are we looking at as we come down Central Avenue? Uh, what type of businesses are going in? I can tell you, um, as Brian said, uh, recently I've bought another building that uh, was going to be leased to a very unattractive user. I'm not going to get into that on uh, adjacent to the uh, landmark building. So I had to purchase that building. So again, I think the use for the for Central and the key to, the entrance to our city, and not without you know getting into people's civil liberties or anything, but I think we need to be real aware of what's going in these structures to protect everybody's investment and draw investors uh, for the future. Mr. William, you said that you've been you've been real pleased with the city and, and your dealings with the city. Have have you had to overcome any obstacles? Has, has there been any things? Uh, the city's, I mean, I had to put in a fire road at the. This comes down to life safety a lot. What you're dealing with downtown, I had to build an eighty thousand dollar fire road at the atrium. If you pull in there, you see this road, and I thought, well, why do I have to do that? Well, the fire marshal said in case I want to get my truck in there. Well, I already had a road and I already had a facility, a lot like these facilities have now. But once they explained to me what could happen if that path was blocked and the structure kind of sits on a peninsula, a lot like downtown is kind of landlocked. Uh, you know, downtown Hot Springs is basically a, a pig trail through two mountains. And it's landlocked. If there's a fire, it could get serious quick and hard to get to. So I, I didn't have any problem once it was explained to me. I built the fire road, and we was able to utilize it for our truck deliveries and different things like that. So, uh, when, again, I deal with life safety code. Uh, I've developed close to $300 million across the southeast that I've personally owned and built uh, of developments. I'm very familiar with working in small towns, and working with cities, and Hot Springs has never been unreasonable. I think that the issue is, is when you take, we've got some occupied buildings that are in a lot worse shape than Ken Wheatley's buildings. Uh, I've looked in Ken's buildings. I mean, I plan on buying a few if I get some time, uh, if my schedule opens up. I do this as an investment for Hot Springs. I'm not going to make any big return on it. Don't expect to. Um, so, but again, I've, I'm okay with the city. Do I think everyone should sprinkle these buildings by a certain time? You know, I don't know. I don't know people's financial position. I mean, you know, maybe they can't get mortgages on them. Maybe, I mean, I, I don't think that that's fair. I think there's a way to make it safe and still get what the city needs on a life safety issue. Without being sprinkled. Uh, firewalls and the... What the building's made of, I've been in every, just using Ken, not to pick on Ken, but he has two or three buildings that I would sprinkle tomorrow. And he has probably 10 that are fine. Uh, again, the upper floors are cleaned out in them. Uh, he keep, has a maintenance guy go through them. Uh, that's why I was late today. I actually walked through a few of the buildings and wanted to look at them uh, and see what kind of condition they were in. So... Uh, I can tell you with the Malco, I pretty much gutted it back to the original theater. So it's, mas it's an all masonry structure. There is no wood in the Malco theater. It's just a concrete structure. Um, the, the ceiling, it, the roof is wood. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and I'll tell you something else. And when you're dealing with the new fire code, it's a lot cheaper to sprinkle with plastic. I'm putting plastic in my hospital in places. You can't mix plastic with steel. Uh, but I think if, if plastic's acceptable, I think it's quite a bit cheaper and easier to install than some of these steel sprinkler lines. So, Rick, do you have any? Do you have access to any incentive programs that actually help in the investment? You know, Randy, that's funny. You know, I sit with the chamber the other day and we talked about programs. I'll tell you how disappointed. I don't do politics well, if y'all can't tell. Uh, I use my own money. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't really get the – I'm in a health care business, and so naturally I'm in a government business. And I'm so disappointed in government uh, <laughs> and bureaucracy that I just have zero faith in the system, okay? Um, but here's what I will tell you. I can tell you that a friend of mine told me about the 504 program when I was doing the atrium. I created 60 jobs. I went to Arkansas Capital Corporation, went into Al Hodge's office. He looked at my financial statement. First thing they told me is you can't, you know, oh, you do your own work. I've got to get every receipt, every check. So I had thousands of documents that I had these people shipped over. This while interest rates were going up, by the way. I walked in Al's office and he looked at my financials. And he said, Rick, if I had your money, I'd go to the house. And as I waited on him, I seen him shaking hands with the governor and shaking hands with the governor and for economic development. And I'm thinking, this guy's over creating jobs in our communities and lending money to do it. I didn't, I didn't qualify for a 504. They said I had too much uh, access to conventional financing. So, again, I don't think... I understand new market tax credits. If you're going to own the property for uh, the next seven to ten years, it gives you a 15 to 20 percent down payment and ha helps you. I think you can utilize the new market tax credits. But again, I think the chamber and the city needs to identify the law firms that are willing to work on the tax credit apartment or tax credit, uh, new market tax credits, and assist the developers to connect with those new market tax credits. But no, I don't have a lot of faith in government assistance, but well, especially when it comes to development, I think there's a lot of needs out there and it's hard to meet them all, you know, not picking on the government. I just don't utilize it for myself. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Next on the list of uh, presenters is Willie Gilbert. Uh, he's taken sick tonight, so his wife, Ann Gilbert, is going to make his presentation. Greetings to the Downtown Game Plan Task Force. My name is Ann Gilbert. I live at 111 Prospect Avenue, number 60. My husband and I own and run the American Art Gallery at 724 Central, Central Avenue in beautiful downtown Hot Springs. Willie and I run the gallery now for at least 21 years plus. We also make our home at 111 Prospect in the Courtyard Condominiums just off Central Avenue. We purchased our building at 724 Central December the 31st, 1992, and opened uh, the business January 18th, 1993. We bought our condo in July of 2002. We've made the condo our home, and we really love living in the downtown. Residing downtown gives us easy access to open and close our business every day. We also enjoy being able to visit along the avenue and stroll along Bathhouse Row and the Grand Promenade in the National Park. We look forward to continuing to be part of the downtown in Hot Springs for the next few years to come at least. Our building at 724 has been fairly easy to keep up. We try hard to keep it good looking. Over the years, we've added awnings and reworked the front. Other than that, we've done a lot of routine maintenance inside and out. Owning a building, you always have something to do. 
Some of the hardest obstacles that we faced and overcome are connected to the 9-11 event as the economy was become like a roller coaster after that event. And tax revenues, I'm sure, for the city may be down the next few months due to the harsh winter weather because downtown people don't get out and shop as much when the weather is too cold or too hot. Last Friday was a beautiful day, and we had a large turnout for the first Friday gallery walk. Good weather. People will be there for that. And they like to come out and walk along the avenue. My long-term vision for Hot Springs is to see new business, large and small, come into the downtown area. We do need more rooms for visitors, as well as more residential space for downtown. Upstairs condominiums are small apartments. People visit America's first resort for an unlimited choice of things to do. The spas, the horse racing, beautiful parks, lakes, shopping, hiking, and attending gallery walks that have been in existence for over 25 years. And I might add that I've attended every gallery walk except one. Eventually, most all visitors that come to our city wind up down in our historical downtown national park. And this is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. And I thank you for giving me a few moments of your time. Ms. Gilbert, I asked you the question that I've, I've asked the others. Have you experienced any obstacles in in dealing with the city and with your business that, that you can think of? No, sir. Most of the time, if you'll come and ask if you have a problem, there will be someone address the problem and advise you as to how to approach it and what you need to do. <coughs> and our structure is a two-floor building. Perhaps you could share how the arts culture of the community helps to sustain businesses like yours. People come here from many different countries and states, and they shop in our area, and they purchase art, which we'll ship for them, or they may take it with them. It also includes crafts. We do have a large amount of craft in our gallery. I'm a native of the area, and I do have some Native American people who have craft in my shop, and I have a lot of Southwest jewelry that comes out of New Mexico and Arizona as well. But I also carry local artists on the lower floor and wood turnings, um, sculpture. I think the art community provides uh, a chunk of your economy downtown. I can't tell you the percentage. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Next would be Steve DeMont. Good evening. I'm Steve DeMont and Probably going to share a little bit different uh, story this evening than maybe some of the other property owners. I'm going to visit tonight about Summit Bank and uh, why it chose to build a new facility on Washita Avenue, which I consider pretty close to the heart of downtown, and I think it's a great place to do business. Summit Bank came to Hot Springs in the spring of 2000. I became the regional president. Uh, in early 2001. Uh, Ross Whipple, who I had worked for before, had always wanted to, when he came to Hot Springs with a bank, had always wanted to come and, and locate downtown. It was apparent uh, when we started talking about planning a site that uh, people thought we were just absolutely crazy. That we had no, that why in the world would you want to build, especially your main facility, uh, in downtown, and I guess we just didn't know any better. I mean, you know, uh, downtown has always been vital to every community, and the financial services business is also vital to downtown. And so we didn't really think anything about it. And so in uh, early 2002, we acquired a site at 333 Washita Avenue, which was across the street from 
a company that I owned is Garland County Title Company. And I, of course, had sat there for several years watching the traffic that goes up and down Washita Avenue and how I think amenable it is to, to, to business because it's local traffic, it also moves well. And so we began to building the building and we employed uh, David French to, uh, uh, to be the architect. And the one thing we told David, we wanted this building to look like it had belonged there for a while. And so we wanted to, we, we put the building at, next to the sidewalk. Uh, it did present some, some issues, re especially regarding parking and, and, and how we would be able to fit the size of that building on that footprint. But it did work. And so I'm here to tell you that it can work in downtown Arkansas in Hot Springs. And we not only need tourist traffic in downtown, we need local traffic. We need local economy. And I can tell you that when I got asked to be put on the Chamber of Commerce board in 2001, and I was on that board for three years, and I soon decided I knew why people kept asking us. We were about we were crazy to go in downtown because I don't think the word downtown Hot Springs was ever uttered in the three years that I sat on that board. And I'm at least glad to know now that we seem to have a chamber of commerce that has some interest in in, in playing a vital role in this economy. And if I had anything as far from a visioning standpoint that I think needs to happen, somebody needs to wake up working for the Chamber of Commerce or the city or whatever, and they've, they've got to think every day, how are we going to improve downtown? How are we going to get people down here? And we're not talking about just tourists, but we're talking about the people that live here and, and work here. It's amazing when, and I know a lot of you that are business owners and, re, and retail owners in, in downtown Hot Springs, how you talk to people and they, you talk about a business and they say, well, where's that? I can't tell you how many people I've told what a great place Central Fusion is to eat. And they'll say, where's that? Finally, when I tell them it was a former ABT bank branch, they get, oh, yeah. So I don't know how to do it, but we've got to do it, and it's, and it's just not going to come by... By by the by by tourists, which obviously is is so important to our economy, but we can we can make it work if we can get the local local business to come because it does work. Summit and I think the embassy suites are from a private capital standpoint are the only two facilities that have been built from the ground up in I wouldn't know how many years, and uh, I can tell you the embassy suite seems like it works pretty well too. Summit, as you, many of you know, just got through selling to the Bank of the Ozarks. Uh, the Washita location was our second largest depository, had approximately $100 million in deposits in that, uh, in that location. Uh, it was the headquarters in for the city of uh, six branches. It also had uh, the largest commercial portfolio in town, and they were all, all of those loan officers were on that second floor. So I'm here to tell you and to tell the, tell the people here that it can work, but you've got to you got to have a vision. You've got to you've got to take the step and invest in it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions. Steve, are you are you pleased with this move that the city and the chamber are having at this point in time? Does it make you feel better, worse, or just so? Well, I think that anybody that knows me knows that I was very vocal when we had this effort a couple of years ago to uh, try to raise this money to, to build an industrial site somewhere down the road. And I always thought that Hot Springs somehow, somehow has, a, has an identity problem. This is, hot, this is Arkansas's playground. And this is where people want to come. And we need to recognize that. And yes, I think we need to be trying to always find good, clean industry. And, and, but the chances of us getting huge factories in here, with, because we don't have the skilled labor pool, and we don't, we're not, and the transportation's an issue. We're, we're not on the, on the rail or on the highway. We've got to, we've got to work with what, what we've got. And as people before me have said, 
we've got something that no other, no other cities in this state have, or in fact, in fact of this region. I have a, my family owns a bed and breakfast in, uh, out on Park Avenue. I guess that's upper, upper downtown. And uh, we just had a couple this weekend that flew, flew from Chicago that came in Thursday. They left, they left yesterday morning, had a wonderful time. They spent night, the only time they left downtown was to go to Garden Gardens. But they came here, never been here before. They came here solely for the reason that they wanted to see downtown. And they were happy when they, when they left. So we've got, a, we've got a lot to sell, but we've got to, we've got to, we've got to channel it correctly. And I think this is a great start. And, uh, and as I do, as I, and, I, and I also agree with some of the other property owners, everybody needs to be included in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Anthony Taylor, but the committee here has asked that uh, he also address us on the basis of the Hot Springs uh, Initiative, the Downtown Hot Springs Initiative, which is adding another, another log on his fire. He's an architect, property owner, and a member of the Downtown Hot Springs Initiative. So we're going to allow you a couple of three extra minutes to Thank you get all much. those topics. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy that this um, effort's being undertaken. My name is Anthony Taylor. I've been an architect in Hot Springs since 1986. Uh, in 1987, my business partner, Bob Kempkus, and I bought the building at 210 Central Avenue. Top two floors were condemned, and the bottom floor had a strip joint in it. And the north end of, down, of downtown Hot Springs had recently recovered from its uh, red light zone status, and we were the proud landlords of the last strip joint in downtown for about six months while we found a way to put money into the building. We were new, we were green, we were 30-something architects, wet behind the ears. Um, the old guys on the avenue who had worked in the, in the shill joints and uh, uh, the auction houses uh, laughed at us. We laughed back at them thinking that we had just stolen a nice building. And indeed, it's kind of turned out that way. We've had our offices here for 28 years now. Uh, we've always had work. We have participated as architects in some of the major remodels downtown, the Mountain Valley Spring Company building, the Selected Funeral and Life Insurance Company building, the Transportation Plaza and Depot, the uh, resurrection of the building at, uh, that Long Wah owns. It had been slated for demolition uh, and was indeed crumbling to the ground. <clears throat> we managed to get it stabilized to a point where it is now occupied again. We turned the last drugstore downtown into the Martin Marietta <coughs> headquarters. Uh, we also helped Thomas Nagin with the Crest Department store and what he's done there, as well as another dozen or so uh, facade remodels. We've not, you know, uh, we work in many jurisdictions all over the Mid-South, and, and as far as any complications with Hot Springs Code or the city regulations. This town has a very professional organization. They're very thorough. Uh, they are as competent as anyone we work with. We work in, in Memphis and Little Rock, Jackson, Tennessee, Jackson, Mississippi, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Shreveport. And uh, uh, the people we have here are very knowledgeable. They are always willing to help you if you have a question. I do wish that they had a comprehensive list that could be handed out to anyone who was was looking at a, a building project. There is indeed somewhere a list for for uh, business owners who want to to uh, locate downtown, which does uh, outline the various commissions and departments that they have to go see, and, and uh, one of those being the Historic District Commission, which does oversee signage. The Sandwich Board, uh, Sandwich Boards used to be controlled by the Central Business Improvement District Number 2, which now no longer exists. So it uh, could be that there's a disconnect there within the departments not knowing who is to regulate that. But um, what downtown has an incredible potential. It does have to have residents, permanent residents downtown, in order to once again have a drugstore downtown. It was, it's been 28 years since there was one downtown. We now have a small convenience store, but residents downtown would, would uh, 
probably, well, we, and now we have a green grocer up on Park Avenue, which is another good thing. But part of that may be because we do have some apartments downtown now. We've uh, been responsible now for several apartments on the upper floors of buildings and are, have four more under construction right now. Uh, utilizing the new existing building code, which I think was mentioned here last week. Uh, that code is, uh, it is very forgiving when you're dealing with a building with historic features. It allows you to keep those historic features in exchange for a fire sprinkler system. Were we to undergo, if we were to undertake this same project under the, exist, the uh, international building code, we would lose probably 80% of those historic features or have to spend additional money to fake them in. Uh, when you have the international existing building code, you're actually allowed to just keep them as it is in exchange for a sprinkler system. Uh, I think this is, is a good uh, trade-off for a downtown. The, the boundaries of that district, which I understand you've published now on, on the website, uh, were, I think, very carefully drawn because the, that area, in, it, it takes in most of the places where there are buildings that, that uh, precede 1930, 1920, uh, buildings with some historic character. And uh, I, know, I know the issue with, with uh, 24 buildings being out of compliance and considered unsafe is, is a big one. It's one that is going to cost people money. I would hope that perhaps the Chamber Metro Partnership Alliance could work together with some of their members who are, are banks and possibly establish some sort of a loan pool whereby step number one of this, well actually it would be step number two, step number one is simply establish a plan. Step number two is implement the first stage of that plan. The first stage of that plan is the expensive one. That's getting the water from the, the street into your building and turning up the fire riser, preparing to sprinkle the building. That's expensive. After that, sprinkling the building one floor at a time, one year at a time, is not so, is not so costly. It runs anywhere from 50 to 80 cents a square foot for just that distribution after you've put in your, your fire sprinkler main. That's the big cost. Um, is the fire sprinkler main inside the building? Or is that outside the building? That fire uh, sprinkler well, main. Well, the main has to come from the outside to the inside. Okay. But then that main turns up into a riser assembly that has valves and gauges and expensive things on it. And is that riser on the inside of the building or the yes, outside of the building? It's on, on the, the inside, inside of the building. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, Downtown Hot Springs Initiative. Before I speak about that, I would like to. Uh, talk about Whippoorwill Avenue and parking. Uh, when the Central Business Improvement District was uh, in its last breaths, there was a, a parking study underway. Uh, Ken Wheatley, I think, at his own, his, his own expense and his own uh, uh, initiative, counted parking spaces downtown. And then there are about, I think he found, 1,500 parking spaces available on any given day. Some of that includes uh, properties that would be shared by, uh, say, the federal building on weekends and, and other businesses on weekends only. Uh, that being said, the first big development downtown is going to tax parking. It's going to tax the existing parking. There needs to be a public-private parking authority established now. It needs to begin studying where and how you finance parking lots. The University of Arkansas Urban Design um, Study Center, I've forgotten the exact name of it, did a, a parking study of downtown six or eight years ago. Uh, it was very informative. I have a copy of it at my office if anyone wants to look. Parking is not the only issue. Loading is also an issue, loading and unloading. Uh, it's frustrating when I have a meeting on the south end of downtown, I leave from the north end and there's a, a truck double parked unloading on 
Central Avenue, it backs traffic up for blocks and blocks and blocks. Uh, people get very frustrated. Uh, the CBID did identify many loading zones in that last parking study, and many of those trucks are using those loading zones, but there needs to be a little more enforcement so that the that trucks understand you cannot double park on Central Avenue. There was an agreement at the time between CBID and the, park, uh, the police department that they would actually enforce that between the hour, hours of 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. If, if that was simply done, it would really alleviate the situation quite a lot. I, I have some slides here that I'd like to show uh, for, uh, what have I got here? Parking. This is, uh, this is a parking lot owned by uh, Don Bridges. That will come up here in a second if you'd go, yeah, right there. Um, this has been identified by the University of Arkansas group as one location for a parking deck that would also include commercial on the front and housing above. Next slide, please. <coughs> on the bottom of the screen, or right through the center of the screen here, you see Central Avenue. Upper left is Loray's Jewelers and the street beside it, which is Smart. Fountain Street? Uh, no, Mark Mountain. Mountain, Mountain Street. Mountain Street. Uh, <clears throat> the end of Mountain Street and uh, Exchange Street begins the right of way of Whippoorwill Avenue. If you look in the woods behind the buildings to the up side of the buildings, you'll see the trail faintly. Next slide, please. This is the Don Bridges uh, property where the parking lot could a multi-story parking deck could and should be built. Next slide, please. And then there's Whippoorwill Avenue with a cul-de-sac uh, right behind, uh, I believe that is the Aristocrat, um, mm -hmm. Dugan, Dugan, Dugan Stewart, and then leading down from, from the mountain down to Central Avenue. This creates a place for deliveries. This creates a place for secondary fire access. This creates uh, a way that you could actually capture some stormwater, which might also lead you to some funding through FEMA and funding through the Department of the Interior, who recently had to pay a legal bill for flooding one property on Central Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the, the continuation. Next slide, please. Same parking lot. Next slide. Same. Next slide. Then this parking deck. If the, if the medical arts building is ever to be developed, that has to become a parking deck, uh, the surface lot next to it. This shows Whippoorwill Avenue coming on down and coming down to that deck. Next slide, please. And then a final extension, which is probably not feasible because it would be, it would require a suspension bridge behind Keeley's uh, property. Uh, that probably can't be done to bring it on down to its conclusion, although the avenue itself actually runs all the way over to Whittington Avenue behind St. Mary's. Uh, the topography just gets too bad, too hard to, to deal with at that point. So thank you. Uh, there were some issues. These are issues. It provides uh, the pros. It would provide rear access, parking, deliveries, fire protection. Uh, it can also be used as a storm drainage culvert. It could actually be built as a box culvert to catch the water and to alleviate uh, some of the flooding in the back of those buildings. Uh, it would require an environmental impact statement, cooperation of the National Park Service, and it would be very expensive. But that first little bit of it to that first parking deck is a very doable project. And it's one that really needs to be undertaken if downtown is going to be developed. It, it, downtown will bust at the seams the first couple of projects with, with parking and deliveries. Thank you. Um, downtown Hot Springs Initiative. Uh, yes, Ken, there are a group of some people who have been looking at what might happen downtown. Nobody ever meant to exclude anyone. Uh, and you can believe that or not, but it's the truth. And that downtown Hot Springs initiative is a group of people who ponied up cash money and formed a mutual benefit nonprofit in order to try and help the downtown area develop. It's not in anyone's particular image it simply is what can we do downtown to help this city 
realize its potential. My vision of downtown has all local merchants in nicely redone buildings with residents living above it, with some businesses interspersed. I mean, businesses that are not retail businesses, businesses like, say, uh, a warehouse or office or a title company or uh, businesses that uh, include local people, not just cater to the tourists. Because you have to have that local. Uh, you know, I have three other partners, and, and uh, we redid the Quapa bathhouse, and we've been open for five years now. We have 10 months of very good business. January and February, hardly anyone's through the doors. But that can change and would change were there people living downtown and people with local businesses downtown. The D Downtown Hot Springs Initiative has been responsible for getting Wi-Fi downtown. They have picked up the slack when the CBID was knocked out or put out uh, and have brought in people to talk to to find out how things can be done. We brought in a man from Memphis who talked to us about how they, their public and private partnerships work and how they put um, businesses together and parking together. And this is not uh, and doesn't have to be a competition between different factions and people. That's not how things should work. This is just simply a group of concerned property owners who have put up money to form a group to try and find something that can work. Now, I thank the Chamber and the Metro Partnership Alliance for doing the same thing. Um, uh, it's, we're all in this together and all need to work together. And there's been enough backstabbing and sniping and uh, trash talking of people. Don't need any more of it. Questions? Mr. Taylor, um, it's my understanding that property owners must submit, and this has to do with the Thermal Basin Code, by the way. Property owners must submit plans for corrective actions to the Hot Springs Planning Department by September the 30th. That's my understanding. In, in your professional opinion, is this enough time for that to be done? Yes. Since, um, from the time that it was first announced to September 30th, it's plenty of time. And when was it first announced? to your understanding. It's been 60 or 90 days, hasn't it? I believe. So if, 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 we, if we started to clock today, with September the 30th being the, the time that it has to be submitted, would that be enough time? I, I don't believe there's any uh, uh, requirement that any development plans be submitted. The, sub the submission is simply for fire protection plans. That involves bringing a water line into the building, turning up this fire riser I talked about, mm -hmm. and uh, showing probably, a, a, I would think, that they would accept a, even a conceptual layout of sprinkler heads for the upper floors. The main thing there is that first step of getting the fire riser into the building. And, you know, there are, I think, a few other things, because I think there are some buildings that have had stairways removed. Uh, um, those would have to be shown to come back in. So, yeah, there, there's plenty of time, but people have to, you know, they can't wait until the last month. They can't wait until the last two months. They need to get started. Mr. Taylor, the, the, there is a lot of discussion about the thermal basin concept and the 24 buildings that have been identified as unsafe. <clears throat> when we're asking the downtown developers or the downtown property owners to participate in an effort to um, grow their buildings one way or the other, how many of them are going to fall into the uh, requirements of the 2012 code because they're changing uh, purpose, you know, occupancy of the floors. Yeah. I, I really don't know how many of them would. But uh, they would, they would in fact come under, uh, they, do they have to bring their whole building up to code then under the new 2012 life safety code? It's my understanding that the existing building code is going to require buildings three stories and higher to that have that are not currently occupied and have been deemed unsafe to install a fire sprinkler system over the course of several years in order to 
stay unoccupied. Were a person to develop that building, they would still have to install the sprinkler, but then they would have all the other benefits of having developed it and having it income producing. Okay, I'm asking the question for the buildings that are safe, but I mean, the, the, the law still applies to all of the 78 buildings. But, but if there is not a change of occupancy, there is no requirement that they come up to code. So now if they are going to change them as a part of this development, do they fall into the requirements for sprinkler system that they might not have other been, otherwise been subject to? No, they, uh, they still would have been required to have a sprinkler system okay. if they changed occupancy and they developed the building. Okay. It's the, the, the only change, as I understand it, is that by voiding the Hot Springs Vacant Structure Code, which was um, a deal made by a fire chief and a major property owner here 25 or 30 years ago, it was unique to Hot Springs, it does not exist anywhere else in the world, uh, it allowed the upper floors of buildings to be sealed off as long as they were cleaned out. It was an attempt to stop uh, piece by piece uh, single room occupancy development that was going on in, in the upper floors of those buildings. So that code was vacated when the existing building code was adopted. That is the only reason why the buildings that are unoccupied and are considered unsafe must be sprinkled now. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Good Thank input. you. Thank you. Good input. Um, Next, we'd like to hear from Monty Scott. I, I would like the opportunity to say something. No. We don't have public comment at this meeting. Thank you. Um, could, could Peggy, you could no you, public comment, please. I came here because I was told to come here to speak. Were you invited? You're not on my guest list. No, uh, Mr. Uh, Kirby Williams said I wasn't. And I only had one comment. And, and please. And for the people that come, came here tonight, that got dressed, that came here to participate as property owners, uh, I want to apologize to them. Well, if that was and their I understanding, I, I will apologize that they were under a misunderstanding. Now, please. In 19 sit down. years, I never denied anyone to speak, and that's a matter of record. And I'm just so sad to to see people would, come down here. We would, and we would love all your comments speak. and input on the website. I never let, did that to anyone in 19 years. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we'll hear from Monty Scott. My name's Monty Scott. I'm the president of the Arlington Hotel Company and the Hot Springs uh, Golf and Country Club Association. Uh, my family's been involved in business in this town uh, starting in the late 1920s with the acquisition of the Majestic Hotel and in 1953 the uh, acquisition of the Arlington Hotel and the Hot Springs Country Club. Um, I want to thank all of y'all, a bunch of my friends up there, for volunteering your time uh, to do this. Sometimes it's not well appreciated and uh, you have to face a lot of heat, but uh, thank God somebody is willing to do it and I appreciate your efforts. Um, in keeping with the uh, outline that you've asked me to address, um, we have made uh, substantial investments uh, in uh, our properties here in town over the last 15, 20 years. Um, we tried to save the Majestic. We invested uh, seven and a half million dollars in that property uh, leading up until the time we closed it in 2006, uh, mainly because we thought it would be in our best interest uh, to keep that part of town alive and vibrant and not have a vacant and uh, closed building, that that would be good for the Arlington. Uh, we fought the good battle. We lost. And when we uh, finally donated it to a tax-exempt entity in hopes that they could apply for certain grants and tax credits uh, and then use that to fix it up, uh, 
same recurring problem uh, that they had uh, that we have had, which is uh, that the main problem that we see isn't the vacant buildings or the condition of downtown. That's a symptom of what the real problem is, which in our opinion is we lack economic vitality. Uh, if we had good business, then people who own property downtown would be fixing it up and renting out the property. But until we get the real problem, as we see, revenues up, uh, we don't see how you can build it and they'll come works. You have to be able to pay back your investment. And to do that, you have to have increased revenues. <clears throat> we uh, cannot get loans from banks to fix up our properties. They will not loan us money uh, based on our standalone business. The only way we've been able to continue to invest our money in the Arlington, and before that the Majestic, is to get it from other sources. But from a business point of view, we can't borrow money uh, from banks because they don't see the economic wherewithal that it'll be repaid. Uh, and that's sort of what the tax-exempt people and the tax-exempt-oriented developers run into, is they can't get money from the state. The state looked at their projects and go, it doesn't make any sense. You won't be able to pay back the low-interest note or the no-interest note. So again, I'm coming back to the main problem being we lack the economic vitality that we need to have. And you have to have that first before, in our opinion, you can start fixing up the buildings. Um, uh, your other question was, what are our hopes for the future? Well, we hope what everyone wants. We want downtown to blossom. We want it to be uh, economically viable. We want lots of shops and lots of different businesses, people living downtown. We want more tourists. Uh, I think we all want the same thing. Um, but we need to bring the economics back. That'll help everybody's revenues. Um, I guess the main obstacle that I see um, is a sort of we versus them uh, attitude. Uh, I know Anthony mentioned that they've been inclusive. But I can tell you that until Brian called me for the chamber meeting two weeks ago, uh, I was never included in any of the conversations previous to that. Um, I met with a couple of people like Mark and Keeley in 2005, and we talked generally about what was going on. Um, but that was the end of it. They're, they're not being inclusive. You'll hear this over and over again. I know Brian heard it at the <clears throat> chamber meeting. Um, and I don't see how mandating jail time and $500 a day fines on property owners is a really good idea for economic development. Uh, that's just... <laughs> I know a lot of people are frustrated about why things are the way they are, uh, but I don't think um, economically forcing private property owners to sell their business for 25 cents on the dollar so that some outside developer will come in and be able, because he paid a cheap price, maybe he can meet all the requirements and build something in hopes that someone will come is the answer. Um, I think Steve DeMott had a good, a good angle, which is that every day uh, our city directors need to be thinking about downtown. Uh, it is really the heart and soul of what we do. Um, it, it bothers me from a, a personal point of view that um, I've um, donated eight years of community service serving on the A&P Commission. Uh, my wife has uh, given 12 years to the Garvin Gardens. Um, 
we, we give $30,000 a year in donations to the local community and another 30 or 40,000 in in kind. Um, and maybe a hundred other things. And if, and if all we ever did was donate one minute, it would be one minute more than the owner of the embassy suites ever gave. It would be one minute more than the owner of the Hampton Inn ever did, or the Austin Hotel, or almost any other property in town. Uh, Ken Wheatley has given 15 years and t countless other hours of community service. If that has any merit to anyone, you need to protect those people, not try and run them out of business. Ouch. <laughs> no. questions? Any questions? Mr. Scott, right, Mr. Scott, you indicated that loans have been denied. Can, can you confirm how many loans you've applied for and have actually been denied? Sure. Um, we have a, a general banking relationship with um, uh, Regions Bank, first commercial before that. Uh, that goes back uh, decades. Uh, maybe because of their unique circumstance, economic circumstance, where they got into distress, uh, they basically told us to close out our accounts with them, uh, any loans we had. We moved to uh, Bank of the Ozarks. Uh, and these are all good friends of mine. And they looked at our financial statement, and we showed them the kind of money we needed to operate on lines of credit in order to continue to make uh, continuing repairs and maintenance. Um, and they said, not unless you give us additional collateral. Uh, they did that with the uh, Hot Springs Country Club, and they did that with the Majestic, and they did that with Arlington, which we did, and that's why, you know, when we look at how much we spend each year on repairs and maintenance and capital expense, uh, it's well in excess of a million dollars a year. You know, a big, we don't have a mortgage on the Arlington, so our mortgage is, it's an old hotel, and every year we have to spend money to fix the roof or to uh, redo the carpet or the rooms or the public spaces. Um, recently, we have had to spend $160,000 on a new fire escape, life safety issues. Well, you can't argue with life safety. I mean, that's something you have to do, whether you agree with the fire chief or not. We didn't agree with him, but we did what we were supposed to do. Um, but, you know, we work with people, and we've had a pretty good working relationship for many years with the city on these different things. Um, Recently, it's changed. The attitude is more of uh, certified letters, and you will do this, and if you don't, then we'll put you in jail. Uh, a week ago, I received a letter from another uh, department of the city addressed to concerned property owner. Gave me 30 days to fix or have a plan for fixing the facade of the hotel. It seems to be coming week after week, and I assume it's because of the direction of the new city manager, and he may have gotten that direction from a unanimous vote or a unanimous feeling from the city board. Uh, that's a problem. I've, I've heard on, 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 <clears throat> on more than one occasion that there's been a lack of communication or no communication at all. If there was a meeting to take place between the property owners and whoever, who would that whoever be? Who would the property owners want to meet with? Who would you want at that table? Um, city manager, because he's ultimately in charge of the fire chief and the code enforcement and all the things that at this moment are particularly impacting the Arlington Hotel. Um, the meeting that you had at the chamber, again, that was so refreshing because it's the first time ever that the Arlington's been included in any kind of meeting. Uh, all the other meetings we had before that were 
where we were told what the plan was, but we weren't involved in the planning. So city manager is the most important part because he reflects the city board and represents all of the different departments of the city. And then with y'all, because all of y'all have volunteered your time, you've been in the trenches, uh, you know the battles, uh, you've got a, a good feel overall of, of the history, and that's important to have. Have you ever requested a meeting with the city manager? Yeah. And yeah. what was the response? Uh, well, it had to do with uh, the city um, using uh, Garland County Industrial Development uh, to structure sweetheart deals for John Q. Hammonds in building the embassy suites. And I was told at that meeting, where I had a lawyer with me, that uh, that, that meeting was not subject to freedom of information and they would not divulge anything about it. That kind of ended that. Has there any, any, any meetings, have you requested any meetings with the city manager concerning uh, your property downtown? I have. I had a meeting with the city manager, the fire chief, and one other fellow uh, uh, about two or three weeks ago. So there has been a there meeting? There was. They okay. just told me again what the letter, certified letter said. There was no give and take. Okay. Mr. Scott, uh, one of the primary concerns for anybody to address their buildings is money. And I've not heard anybody ask for a handout, but, is look, but are looking for help. Do you have any, um, any areas that you sh would ask us to look at in terms of potential financial incentives for the property owners or structures that you know of that would uh, accommodate some of their financing needs? You know, you could go revisit whatever took place for the embassy suites and see what sort of things the city contrived to help them. Okay. I don't have access to that. Um, I haven't had any luck looking to the government to help us. And uh, the tax-exempt people we uh, donated the Majestic to had no luck with the state agencies. They just, again, it came back to they don't see uh, economic vitality. They don't see the revenues in the town to do that. Uh, so everybody who knows me over the years know uh, I'm a proponent of trying to expand gambling into the downtown area because I know that works. And, and when you have economic vitality, then that, that's the economic engine that allows or would allow people downtown to do well, what we see going on on Central right now at, at Oaklawn. Thousands of new jobs, millions, tens of millions of new investment, $100 million in new revenue. It's not a mystery. It's not real hard to figure this out. Uh, we've got a good example down the street. And the track needed that to survive. They were in uh, pretty bad <clears throat> shape with decreasing um, revenues and uh, the awards and purses were going down and they needed that in order to compete. And I think downtown has come to that point as well. I don't think that the town can any longer uh, protect one uh, individual businesses monopoly on gambling. There's just too much of it in every state around us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having this meeting. And last we have David French. My name is David. <clears throat> My name is David French, and I have uh, two properties at 827 and 825 Central. Um, just a bit of a history. I grew up in Hot Springs um, with Mark and Keeley, and uh, uh, went to school away. Then came back uh, when Anthony did in 1986, and. 
um, I've always had my office in downtown. And uh, my first office was in the Medical Arts Building on the eighth floor overlooking Arlington Park and the Arlington Hotel. And there's no better office in this town than that office on the eighth floor. It was great. The, art, the Medical Arts Building is a great building. It also is a fireproof building. It's all concrete, has the fire bricks for partition walls and so forth. But anyway, then I, uh, Melvin Bell came along and he kicked everybody out. And so we went to um, Spencer's Corner and then I was there for 10 years. And then I bought those buildings <coughs> from um, Regents and fixed those buildings up uh, in 1999, 2000, yeah. about is when I did that. Um, we've, <clears throat> as a firm, we have probably worked on 15 to 20 different uh, buildings and remodels uh, in the basin area from new construction to uh, old construction. And uh, we did the Hot Springs High School, and, you know, one of the things there was the historic district wanted us to keep those uh, wood doors and those transoms in the hallways, and uh, we did that by sprinkling the building, but we were going to sprinkle the building, had to anyway by code. Uh, but the sprinkler allowed us to do a lot more than um, what would be required if you didn't didn't have that egress so far as a fire exit through a building or something like that, which the other code is requiring you to do. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, so uh, we've worked on, like I said, you know, many buildings. We're working on uh, the addition to St. Mary's right now, which is a, another big problem in downtown Hot Springs is, is the FEMA flood control system. And we've had to put that building up on stilts uh, to be above flood state. And, and that is a critical situation in downtown. If a building is gone or burns or falls down, uh, you can't build it back unless you put it on stilts if it's in that, in that flood zone. Uh, the Majestic Hotel, I worked on it for seven years. I know every itch and inch and foot of that building. And when that yellow built brick building burned, it, it hurt. And uh, we, we worked with those developers. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, if, you look at a, if you look at a commercial situation uh, anywhere, I don't care where you go, it's primarily first floor retail. Very, very difficult to do second floor retail. And even if you look at these new malls like out in West Little Rock or, or Dallas or, or Destin, Florida, all those buildings will have fake second stories with their one level retail. And so it's hard to put that on the second floor. So that, and if you do, if you look at pretty much any studies on downtowns and everything, they primarily say to revitalize a downtown, you have to have downtown living, because those living, those situations spur other things like Anthony had talked about and and other people had talked about. Uh, it's it's vitally important. And on the Majestic, for instance, that was a that was a thirty million dollar project, soft and hard cost. Uh, twenty four, pretty much twenty four million dollars of construction dollars that were going to go in that building. And and that that developer was very very close. And 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 Monty and Becky were right there with them, trying to work it out. Uh, and when this new guy came in, uh, the last couple of years, it um, he we thought he would have the wherewithal. To, to bring it to fruition, and it just didn't happen. But it was a shame because they were very, very close to making that happen. And as a city, I, I wish we kind of would have rallied around it a little bit to, to help that because that, that's the primary um, um, thing that I, I find trouble with is what do we do with these massive buildings that we have, the Medical Arts Building, the Dugan Stewart. Th those can become an issue uh, because they're just they're big. And you know they you have to you have to fill them up as far as space, and, and another thing that Anthony was talking about was the parking situation. You know the UACDC, which is the Univer University of Arkansas Community Design Center, came down when we were doing the parking deck, and they did this major study in downtown Hot Springs, and they looked at every possible spot to put these um, parking garages. And, and we had that study. I have it in my office. We probably should reprint it and look at it again. But the only spot we could put the parking deck is where it is because that was the only available property that we could have to put that parking lot. And two, the, the impetus behind that parking deck was to, to revitalize the bathhouses where people could park in the parking deck and encourage people to renovate the bathhouses and go for it. So that's why the parking deck is where it is, and that's why it's built. And uh, anyway, so... 
uh, I don't know if any other things I could talk about. Questions? David, um, as you've noted, we grew up together here in Hot Springs, although I'm a bit older than you are. Can't tell it by looking. Uh, but all kidding aside, um, would you not say, and I'm not trying to lead you on, have, have we not been through these uh, roller coaster rides in Hot Springs with different people coming to town and different projects that have come up and gone down? And, and I mean, you've watched many of them as I have. And, and do you see this occasion as an opportunity or do you see it as a detriment? I see it as a big opportunity, and I hate to say it, but sometimes bad things have to happen in order for us to all kind of wake up. And I think the burning of the Majestic was that. And I think a lot of people felt a, a great compassion for that building. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it just made everybody do what we're doing tonight. And it made us all come together and say, you know, we got to do something. You know, I, it, it's amazing. I, I, I think we would all be amazed if we would go to the chamber or the city or whatever and look at all the studies we have done from downtown to around town to any town, you know. And the last study we did, we paid a lot of money for. We asked these unbiased people to come and look at our, our town, our entire town, and say, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you see that we should do? Uh, about Hot Springs. Their number one priority thing that they told us to do was you've got to address the downtown. It's heart of your city. It's where we have our Christmas parades, you know. And so I, I think that we've got to take those people at heart. If we're going to if we're going to pay those people to do these reports and give us information, we should we should take that information and run with it. But I think that it's important. I mean, we have. Mark, you and I have talked about how we've talked about stuff like this for 20 years on what we can do to make things better downtown. Uh, but I, I think we're kind of coming to a threshold where we, we've, we've got to either, you know, fish or cut bait. And um, it, it is hard. It, it's harder having a, a, a building downtown than it is outside of downtown. And, and the reason why is the CBID 3 <laughs> It costs a lot of money every year. Tax, it's, a, it's an added tax. And those that were in CBID 2 know this fairly well, that, it, that it's an added tax when, uh, uh, to, your, to your general tax on your building to pay for all that work that was done in CBID 3. Um, so those property owners in CBID 3 and CBID 2 paid for those site improvements, not the city. The city helped a lot with their um, backhoes and different stuff, but, but those property owners paid, paid for those improvements. But anyway, I don't, okay. Mr. French, um, I will ask you one of the same questions that I asked Mr. Taylor, and it's concerning the Thermal Basin Code. Mm -hmm. With the property owners being required to submit a plan by September the 30th, if these property owners requested work from you could you help them formulate a plan and have it turned in by September the 30th? Um, I could on like <laughs> on certain buildings, but um, you know the, the the building the bigger buildings um, are hard, and uh, if you have several of those all at once, uh, you got to measure those buildings. Um, and I know, and I, t I told Ed this. Um, I told the fire uh, chief. Uh, I said, Ed, I, I called the historic people, and they don't have drawings of downtown Hot Springs. Um, and I know, I know Anthony has measured some, and, and I'm not sure what buildings he's, he's done. But I called Missy, and I said, Missy, do y'all do have plans uh, to the buildings in downtown Hot Springs? Missy McSwain is going to be here next week. She's with the Historic Trust in Little Rock. And she goes, no, I, I have no clue that I, I, we don't have those plans at all. So those, those buildings will have to be measured in order for a sprinkler uh, layout to be submitted to uh, the fire chief and for a sprinkler company to, uh, to do their work as well. So th th there's, there's a lot of time involved in, in doing that. And then, two, looking at the egress situation. Uh, the, e the, the buildings that are six stories and, and above, which are not too many, uh, you know, they have to have enclosed stairways uh, going down and egressing and things like that. So you have to do that. You get structural engineers and different engineers involved uh, with that situation. So 
But in your it's, opinion, it's tight. That it's, it's, it's tight, but um, it's doable. In your opinion, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it's tight. I'm, a, I'm just being candid. Do you think they need more time? Um, it just depends on who comes to you. And I, I mean, I, I hate being that, you know, vague about it. But you know, if if we all kind of had so many so many buildings that <clears throat> that we did, then then I think that we could. But it's Ed, Ed wants those drawings. The fire chief wants those drawings uh, submitted by September 30th. You know, and and he wants the layout. He wants the layout of the sprinkler system. And um, uh, so, I mean, it it's going it's going to take a while. I don't want to get in trouble here. I'm just asking your <laughs> professional opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, but <clears throat> what I what I was going to say too is uh, working with the city. <clears throat> I know I'm an architect, and I, I work with these guys all the time. <clears throat> but we have worked on, on newer buildings and older buildings and whatever. But Mike Scott and Ed Davis have have done nothing but <clears throat> bend over backwards to help us. We'll call. I'll call Mike Scott. I say, "Can you help me on this?" Or "Can you look at this?" He says, "Sure, come over." And I go take drawings over there to him. He looks at it. And said, "You know that you need to do this and this or whatever." But I, I, I've never, and I, I think it's because we work with him so closely, but I, I've never uh, encountered a situation where uh, those two offices have been frictious in any way. You know, I mean, they, the, 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 and two, the thing is, there is a code book. There's a fire code and there's a, uh, you know, a building code. And if I go in and I say, Mike, I want to, I want a diving board off the side of my building. I'm just saying this. And he said, well, the code's not going to allow that. I can't allow that because this code says you cannot have that diving board. So a lot of times we get mad and we get angry <clears throat> because the fire chief or and the fire chief is, I mean, he is huge, powerful in, in wherever he is. And um, uh, but those guys can't they can't tell you no when the code's telling you something. When something's adopted by law, they have to follow that law. Just just like I'm, I have to follow the architectural code, architectural act. Mike Scott, but they have to, they have to comply when someone comes in and says, "I'm going to build a building." He says, "Well, you got to have an architect if it if it has these sort of parameters. You you've got to have an architect because the state of Arkansas says you have to." And so, I mean. They're, they're getting flack about things, but there, there's some give and take on uh, uh, sometimes. But but they do have a book that they have to look up and says this line says I have to do that because it's law. So okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our presentations for tonight. I would remind everyone that there is a uh, blog site set up on the city uh, website at hscity.org under the Our Community tab. That is a point of public reference. If you haven't had your say here, please go there and document your, your positions. Uh,